or well, afternoon. Thanks for coming to our talk. So we're going to be discussing container security and particularly um, the environment in which your containers run. Just a little bit about ourselves. My name's Etienne. Um, I'm a platform security engineer at Heroku, which means a large chunk of my day job is looking after containers, making sure there's no breakouts out of containers, and trying to find ways to break out of containers before they actually happen. Um, I like to do security research, especially finding ways to abuse legitimate functionality um, in unexpected ways. Great. Uh, my name is Craig. I uh, previously worked with Etienne on the product security team at Heroku. I've now moved over to a uh, software engineering role on our runtime team. Uh, so I'm now in, in part of the team that's building out the infrastructure that runs the containers uh, for our customers' applications and the infrastructure that schedules those containers to run. Um, so first I want to just kind of set a scope for what this talk is not about. Um, we're not going to cover the sort of, uh, there have been a lot of other talks that, that go into detail about the software supply chain about your containers. If you are an application developer, you're creating, you're writing Docker files and you have that first line that says from Ubuntu 16.04 and that software supply chain of all those dependencies that come with that. and trying to secure that and keep those up to date. Uh, it's not really what this talk is about and, and hardening containers. Um, we're also not going to talk about container breakouts that require the, you know, elite O'Day kernel syscall vulnerabilities and some like crazy ROP chains. Uh, and the reason is you don't need that uh, is what we found in our research to break out of containers in uh, actual real world environments. Um, and it, this also isn't really an introduction to Kubernetes and, and Docker containers. We're kind of going to assume some level of knowledge of using those things first just to cover all the things we want to get through. Um, and there, there's also been a lot of movement recently as we've been working through this talk on hardening the run times for uh, containers themselves. Um, so like working on sandboxing, multi-tenancy, and, and Kata containers which use virtualization and container technology for securing things and runtime kernels like Gvisor that move um, the Linux kernel into user land. So what are, are we actually going to talk about? Um, so we're going to talk about the perspective of running containers as an operator in an environment where you have multi-tenancy. Multi so you have people are bringing you their containers and you're running them in your environment, uh, whether internally or if you're a platform as a service and things like that, and how to protect that control plane, the orchestration that decides, hey, I want to run a container, okay, we can put you over here on this piece of software, or on this piece of hardware, and, and we'll spin that down over here, and we'll spin this up over here, and all, all that goes into to that. That's a, a new uh, attack surface that's created when you're running uh, container environments. Uh, and we're going to do that through examples of real world environments that we've come across and how we've broken out of uh, containers uh, inside of them. So what is a multi-tenant container environment? Um, so we like to joke that this is remote code execution as a service. Um, we take people's code, you give it to us, and we run it uh, on our servers, and um, we have to assume that they're all malicious and you're trying to mine bitcoins or, or do crazy things. Um, and this is, this is what you'll see in other platform as a service providers, um, if you use a, a hosted CI or CD and you're doing your Docker builds or you're, you're running your code tests uh, within those uh, hosted CI servers, uh, they're running your code for you. Um, and you know the, the new move to like function as a service and serverless. So as a provider, you've needed a way to spin up all of these containers. Previously, um, before the sort of ex explosion of Kubernetes, uh, this was all homegrown stuff. Um, this was, you know, you wrote software that would take someone's container, spin up some EC2 instances, run them inside uh, LXC or Docker or something like that, and then, you know, hope that they don't break out and, and you know, you have multi-tenancy in between them and, and, and all that fun stuff. Now, people are sort of standardizing on Kubernetes, uh, but even with that, there's ton of ways you can deploy Kubernetes and a ton of security configuration issues that come with those various configurations. Um, so now we have more software to run our software, which means more vulnerabilities to look for. Um, so now you have to not just think about CVEs and the underlying operating system that's running your Kubernetes cluster, but CVEs in the platform itself. And so we're going to demonstrate some of those, those issues, um, starting with uh, a vulnerability in Kubernetes itself. 
uh, a vulnerability that Etienne discovered in Git that because Git is a dependency that's used in a deprecated feature of Kubernetes, actually affected Kubernetes in an unexpected way. Um, and then you also need to think about those sort of low level, low risk issues that you might see from Red Hat or Ubuntu that it's like, oh, it's a local privilege escalation. This is a low severity issue because you already need to have access to someone's system. It's not a remote code execution. Well, as a platform, as a service, as a trusted CI, you know, hosted CI service, you're giving everyone that initial shell. So those local privilege escalation issues become a much higher severity. <coughs> All right. Uh, so our first demo, um, this was probably the most severe vulnerability in Kubernetes itself uh, so far. Um, but it came down to just like a classic Linux vulnerability where you have a sim link that's incorrectly followed by a, by a service and then you're breaking out of the directory that you're supposed to be in, inside of. Um, so this is some YAML and um, basically what we have here is this is a YAML that's declaring a pod in Kubernetes um, and within the pod there are two containers. And what the first container is doing is creating a volume called vol and that volume is just a mounted directory inside of that the container will have access to. It exists on the, on the host file system. Um, but what it's doing here is creating a sim link between the root directory and this other directory within, within vol and then it's just going to sleep for a little while. We're then spinning up a second container that's also mounting this and as this container is mounted with a subpath of hosts that we've created with the sim link, the kubelet process, which is the agent running on the actual machine, is mounting this volume and saying, oh, I have this sim link here and I'm running as root on the host. I'm going to mount, I'm going to mount root on the host file system to this and so then within this container, you will have access to the host file system outside of the container itself. So if you're getting started with Kubernetes, um, there's this really cool uh, software project called Minikube. It allows you to very quickly spin up a one node uh, Kubernetes cluster locally on your laptop. The other cool feature is you can specify any version of Kubernetes you'd like. So it's very nice for demos where you want a vulnerable version of Kubernetes. Um, so we spun up a single node Kubernetes uh, cluster. I'm going to SSH in directly to the underlying host just to show you what the file system looks like. We're going to create a file on the file system itself. And then we're going to talk to Kubernetes and there we go. Um, we're going to say spin up that pod with those two clusters that I, that I just showed. We're going to give it a couple seconds to let those get spun up. And then we're just going to directly execute into that second container. And at the, vol, at, at the volume that we mounted, you can see that we actually mounted the host file system on the underlying host outside of the container. And so now I'm going to pass it back to Etienne to give another demo. So as Craig mentioned, when we're looking at the vulnerabilities, we also have to be aware of vulnerabilities in libraries that our platform might be depending on. So for this Git vulnerability, um, Git had a vulnerability where if you cloned a malicious repository and you cloned it recursively, you were able to get code execution. So with um, Kubernetes, there's a Git volume option that allows you to specify a remote repository. Kubernetes, the controller for Kubernetes will go and clone that repository for you and turn that into, uh, into the volume that is mounted into your container. So here we've just got a, a YAML file that does exactly that, specifies a Git volume. When the container gets created, it all mounted as at my path. And what we've got here is we're just pointing to our malicious repository and then we're doing a bit of command injection. Although it's not really command injection. Um, we're just specifying dash dash recursive because it's a prerequisite of the actual attack. So for this one, we're going to again start off with a, a Minikube server. Um, just quickly gonna search into it. Uh, well, check the Minikube server. We've got nothing running in it currently. SSH, uh, check no pods. We SSH in. Um, just going to show you what the, the host file system looks like. 
You see by default we're running as a, a less privileged user. We still got access to Docker and everything, but um, it's less privileged. So what I'm doing here at the bottom, I've just started up a, a SoCat listener for uh, to catch a reverse shell, and then I'm creating uh, our pod at the top there using our malicious YAML file. And you can see almost immediately we get a reverse shell coming back. And you'll see we're running as root. So the nice thing here is we've done a container breakout before the container is even created. Um, and we're running as root because your Kubernetes control plane runs as root. So once Kubernetes is cloning this repository and trying to be helpful for you, it is actually executing code and you're getting root access to the file system. Um, and we've now got full access to everything. And you can see uh, we've actually on the correct host. So the really interesting thing here is that this vulnerability actually manifests itself in, in unexpected locations. Um, so about two weeks ago, I realized that uh, Docker actually allows you to specify a remote repository during your build process. So what you can do is you say to someone, hey, just build my, my Docker container. Here's the Git repository hosting the container. So they can go to that, that repository, they can view the, the Docker file, and they'll see it's just a hello world, doesn't do anything malicious. But when they actually run the build command, you can see it's a very simple command. They run it, and almost immediately we get a shell on their box. Uh, so like I said, this, this manifests itself in really interesting places. Uh, about two days ago, I found a Docker cloud build environment where they actually make this mistake. They allow you to specify a Git repository, and you can just give the Git repository the URL. They'll automatically go and clone it. Um, the way Docker works is it tries to be helpful and does it recursively automatically, and you get root on this build environment. So a very common problem. And this vulnerability is about three months old, and yet it's still, or four months old, and it's still present in these container environments. So what is the solution here? Well, we, we've had the solution all along, and it comes down to good patch management. Now, in your CI, CD world, or your DevSecOps, where everything's shifting left, there's this heavy focus on continuous container security. So everyone's constantly saying, hey, scan your containers. Make sure your containers are secure. You don't have any vulnerabilities in your containers. Um, at a recent conference we were at, there was a slide that went up and said, patching is dead. You don't need to patch anymore. And I was, no. You still have to patch. You can't just scan your containers and say they, you've detected any, you've detected the vulnerabilities, you've updated your containers, you still need to be updating your actual hosting environment where your containers live. It does raise an interesting question, who is responsible for the security in these environments? Obviously, if you're running your own build environment on your own infrastructure, yes, make sure you are updating that infrastructure, but also understand how does your cloud provider do their update process? Do they guarantee that they're only updating the kernel? Do they guarantee that the control plane is being kept up to date? Do they guarantee that the dependencies of the Kubernetes, of Docker, are being kept up to date as well? And you need to make sure you update all the correct parts. So not just your containers. You have to update your operating system. You have to update your control software and your supporting software. So Security has gotten easier in container environments, but at the same time, there's actually a much larger attack surface than before, and you need to be aware of that. Now, another area that we as attackers really like to, to find vulnerabilities are in misconfigurations. So we all know by default, a lot of configurations fail open, and they are very insecure. And in some cases, container environments are that way, and traditionally, they did fail open in a lot of cases, but it's getting better. Container environments come, or container software, especially Docker, for example, come with really good defaults that do protect you from a bunch of uh, really common mistakes. 
But because those defaults are so good, and they are locking down the environment a lot, people do away with the defaults, and they go, oh, I got this, I can change your configuration. And without understanding the, the Linux primitives or the, the configuration options themselves, they just go, well, we don't need seccomp, because seccomp is blocking my build for some reason. So they just do away with seccomp completely, and now you've got a, a vulnerable container. So the, the big three that we normally see in cloud environments, um, or yeah, big three, is exposing your, your Docker daemon or your control plane to the containers. So your container is actually able to speak directly to the Kubernetes API, speak di directly to docker.soc, um, leaving your cloud metadata API accessible. And this is just inadequate network level access control. Your containers can speak to all the same network endpoints that your host can speak to. And then missing or inadequate kernel level protections. So your seccomp profiles are actually really great. Um, so seccomp defines which system calls in the Linux kernel are available in that namespace. So by limiting the number of system calls, you're limiting your attack surface, and you're killing off a, a real large set of it, attacks. Capabilities, you can look at as um, permission sets. So you've got capabilities of Capsys Admin or Capsys Net. So Capsys Net defines whether the process in a namespace is able to open a network socket. So even in a container where your user might be running as root, if you've dropped the capability to create a raw network socket, that container or that root user won't be able to create that raw network socket, and you've reduced your attack surface dramatically. Namespacing, same thing. All your containers are essentially namespaces, process namespaces, and user namespaces. Um, so common one that's forgotten is your user namespacing. Always map your user inside the container to a less privileged user outside of the container. So for this, we want to demo in a typical build setup. Your typical build environment allows a user to specify the, the commands to run, and they usually come with a build.yaml file. So you've, you specify, hey, I want to use the Docker stable image. And once that Docker container starts up, I want you to run APK update. I want you to install some dependencies. And yeah, I want you to create a reverse shell giving me access into that container that's currently building. So very easy to do. Um, this is, you can, you can go try this on any cloud building environment that you want and uh, start exploring. So. So. so what are we gonna do in this demo? So instead of demoing this in a build environment, we're just gonna run the Docker container as they typically do in build environments. So we're dropping the seccomp. Um, see, seccomp is unconfined, and the other option, sorry. So we're running as a privileged container. So never run as privileged containers, it's really bad. So one of the very first things that I usually do when I get into a container, or that attackers do, is to run am I contained. It's a great little tool by Jesse Frizzell. Um, it gives you information about the container runtime environment that you are in. In this case, you can see, because we're running as a privileged container, one, or, and because we dropped seccomp, there's no seccomp, um, we've got all the capabilities that are exposed in the Linux kernel. And also with the privileged container, we can map through and access devices on the underlying host. So what we want to do in this attack is we want to gain access to the root file system from within the container. So for this, we just have a look at what partitions or which disks are available. And your uh, proc partitions is automatically mapped through to all containers. Um, so it's really easy to find out what there is. And here we can see we've got one disk VDA, we've got three partitions, VDA 1, 14, and 15. And just judging by the size, VDA 1 is probably our root file system. So that's the one we want to mount. Just use the Linux uh, mknod utility to create a block device. And then we're going to create a directory. 
and we'll simply mount that block device into that directory. Now, because the directory is mounted, or the volume is mounted, we can just access it, and we've got full access to the underlying host file system. And because we're running as root in the container and we've got a privileged container, it means we've got the same privileges as root outside the container, and we can change root and become root on the underlying host. Really, really easy to do and really easy to get wrong when you're trying to configure your containers. So how do you fix it? Well, when it comes to SecComp and capabilities, go with the defaults. Docker put a lot of effort into ensuring that the SecComp and capabilities profiles are good and they're gonna work in 99.9% .9 of all cases. You are likely not going to need to modify the SecComp profile because the current one allows enough, exposes enough of the Linux kernel to your, to your container to work correctly, but it's locked down enough to prevent uh, malicious actions. If you do wanna roll with your own SecComp, uh, avoid blacklists. So if we wanna try and prevent the previous attack, a naive approach would be, okay, we'll just prevent mknod. So we blacklist the mknod system call. But what actually happens in the kernel is there's this mknod at system call, which is called by mknod. So as an attacker, I just have to write a bit of C, um, and I just call mknod directly, and I've bypassed the seccomp profile. So aim for a whitelist, uh, whitelist approach, say, okay, I wanna allow access to these system calls, and then you can start adding in additional ones if you find it necessary. Capabilities, start off with dropping all your capabilities and then adding them in one by one. Really good thing to do is to combine your seccomp and your capabilities um, so you've got a layered defense. If you have messed up somewhere in seccomp, your capabilities will likely cover you and vice versa. So for example, at Heroku, we've gone with a strict seccomp and a capability set. And we've found that with the last I think at six or seven kernel vulnerabilities that have come out, we've been able to mitigate them f through our seccomp and capability profiles. So even though there weren't kernel patches available yet, the attack was mitigated in our environment through strong seccomp and capabilities. Um, and always avoid running priv uh, privileged containers. The, uh, most cases, it's not necessary, especially now with newer projects such as Image and BuildKit. Uh, it allows you to build containers without needing privileges. So some of the other insecurities we typically see are in your control plane. As I mentioned, exposing your Docker uh, sockets or exposing your, your Kubernetes API. I uh, don't want to go in depth into this because it is a, an attack surface that has been explored quite heavily in the past. Um, there's good references out on the internet about, hey, don't expose docker.sock to untrusted containers. Bad things are going to happen. If you want to read up about it, um, we've put some blog posts up there. I recommend the first one because I wrote it. Um, but all those are really good, good talks uh, or good blog posts. The interesting one for me is uh, the, third, uh, the second one. Um, actually, Kubernetes API is being exposed on the internet. Malicious actors have been gone around, been scanning for those API endpoints, and they've been starting up their own Kubernetes pods through those APIs, and they're just using it for crypto mining, but they could be, could be doing a lot of malicious things. It's also, um, Quite interesting to note that there is a large attack surface when it comes to, for example, a Docker. Uh, traditional knowledge says your docker.sock should not be exposed, but about two weeks ago I found an environment where docker.sock was locked down through, uh, through the plugin system and that made sure that you couldn't do malicious actions, you couldn't run privileged containers through Docker, you couldn't mount the root file system. But if you got access to docker-containerd.soc, you can actually do all of those things. So Docker is abstracted into two components. It's got the container D level, which is running your containers for you, and then it's got the traditional docker.soc, uh, 
which is just an API for Docker to interact with container D. Um, so if you can just gain access to one of those other endpoints, you can also bypass a lot of the traditional security that's being baked in. But interesting to note, um, cloud environments, they do, these days, they are locking down these endpoints. So for example, um, Kubernetes in EKS, they do lock down the API endpoint with RBAC, which prevents access from untrusted containers. But your read-only read API is still exposed without any authentication by default. So as an attacker, I can still read from there, gain interesting information about your environment, and probably use this in further attacks or to escalate uh, privileges. Other control plane insecurities, a typical configuration is to start up your containers and give them the default network and assume that because they're running in their own little container network, nothing bad can happen. But a lot of times, those container networks can speak to other container networks or they can speak to the same networks that your host can speak to. Um, and this also means it can speak to the cloud metadata API endpoints. Well, it's just metadata, just information, right? No. Uh, a lot of these endpoints do provide additional uh, resources that can allow you to escalate privileges. I really recommend the, the first report in particular. It is it's not a container breakout, but it's a server-side request forgery report where they gain access to, to the Docker, to the GCP um, metadata endpoints, and they're able to read in the Kubernetes service account API, API key, and then start up malicious Kubernetes uh, pods and access uh, running pods in that report. So really good one to read up on. Thank you. So we've got some root shells, we've popped calc, we've done all these cool things with containers. We've talked about some of the ways that you can protect against those attacks. Um, sp you know, specifically with the, the ways we, we've exploited these container environments. Um, now we want to take a step and, and see like as an operator of these container environments or as a security assessor who needs to give recommendations to operators, um, how do you give specific recommendations that will apply to your cluster or your multiple clusters that you're running that can be automated, that can be tested, and so that you're not missing those checkpoints and like, ah, I forgot to lock down this one endpoint or I forgot this one security control we have. The guidance we're gonna give is really focused on Kubernetes because that's what we're most familiar with and that's what we've, we've seen either in the wild or in other environments where we're testing. Um, and you know this this would apply probably to other container environments and orchestration platforms like Mesos or Swarm as well, but it's going to vary a little bit. But when we say firewall your cloud metadata endpoint, that's kind of a universal thing. Uh, and then more or less is going to need to be done depending on like the variety of ways you can deploy things. Um, if you're using a hosted solution, you're going to get things like RBAC that we'll talk about in a second for free. That's like how it gets deployed. Uh, if you're doing it homegrown, you, you might have to enable those things by yourself. Uh, so the first first thing, you know, always a good thing to have is access control. Um, Kubernetes had kind of this weak notion of uh, attribute-based access control originally where you had these tokens and they're auto-mounted to pods. Uh, and that was equivalent to root on the cluster automatically. Uh, and now they have uh, RBAC, uh, which is, you know, on by default in most places. And this is a, a much, much better process that lets you have more fine-grained control of what objects in your cluster have access to uh, within the cluster itself. So this is going to be enabled by default. If you spin up the EKS cluster on Amazon, you're going to have RBAC enabled. You're going to be using Amazon IAM as your authentication for connecting to the cluster and talking and interacting with your Kubernetes uh, cluster. Um, but we can go further. So you have your, your Kubernetes API that allows you to control and schedule uh, containers, pods, nodes, other objects within your cluster. Um, that, that RBAC already limits that, that token that's already mounted on the pods that, that I mentioned. Um, so it's not, it's not this all-powerful root token anymore. But if you have customer code running on containers inside of a pod, 
this to they probably don't need to be talking to the Kubernetes API. They just need to run their their payload, their workload, their application. So you can actually disable that service token from being mounted at all. Uh, there's some discussion about making this the default behavior, which which uh, hopefully happens. Um, you can also provide an additional layer of authentication. So if operators are talking to the Kubernetes API, uh, you can have them authenticate not just with a static token, but using uh, third party uh, IAM or OpenID Connect uh, to authenticate people before they can interact with your cluster. Uh, and then that anonymous Kublet, the Kublet is the service running on the node itself, on each individual node. It has some information about pods and containers running on, run, running on the node, and you can block access to that endpoint uh, using network policies or things like Calico or Weave um, that allow you to block the container from talking to those endpoints on the node. Uh, so that 169.254 address, if you have a application running inside a container, inside a pod, inside a node, inside a Kubernetes cluster, you're so far abstracted from needing to talk to the underlying cloud provider that there's really no good reason for most workloads uh, running in inside a container to need to talk to that. Um, Google has recognized this and they have the concept of a metadata proxy and metadata concealment that will prevent workloads running on a GKE cluster from being able to hit that 169 address. Um, Amazon doesn't really have it as locked down, um, but there are third party options like Kubed IAM, which implements uh, IP table rules to block pods from communicating with that endpoint. Um, you can also manually set up a, a network policy to block access to this, uh, and there's some other uh, CNIs, which are network plugins for Kubernetes that, that allow you to configure something like this too. Um, so the, the concept of hard multi-tenancy in Kubernetes is still being discussed. There's a working group around that. I'd suggest anyone who's interested in this topic and just wants to learn more or, or contribute to that, uh, join the working group. Um, that, that first stage of locking down control plane access from pods and containers is sort of foundational to this, uh, but now we want to talk about how to block containers from interacting with each other when you have a concept of multiple clients, multiple customers running within uh, a single cluster. Uh, one thing I, I really like about Kubernetes is the idea of admission controllers. And so these are the, the gate, this is the gatekeeper that can say, if you want to spin up an object on our cluster, you must be this tall ride. And so some of the things that you can configure um, are you can say, you know, like Etienne was saying, like don't allow, don't run privileged containers. And you can define that as an admission controller on your cluster to say if you're trying to run a privileged container or if you do need to run a privileged container, don't allow someone to ex execute a shell directly on that. Like if, there, if it needs to run privilege for whatever reason, it's some part of your control plane or your orchestration, um, you can't actually get a shell to do anything else on there. Um, always pull images is a fun one. Uh, there have been cases where if you have a Kubernetes cluster and it's pulling down Docker images to run, uh, some of those might come from private repositories. If you're in a multi-tenant environment um, and you're caching those Docker images, Kubernetes will say you're request you see that your cluster, your container, sorry, is requesting that image. It has it cached and will let you use that private image, which is not great. Always pull images prevents that from happening by saying you must always get the image from the root, you know, the, the source Docker registry or wherever your, your container images are being stored. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, pod security policies. So this allows you to enforce uh, a lot of the things that Etienne was recommending as uh, solutions like SecComp and, and uh, other things like that. Uh, resource quotas allow you to have limits for noisy neighbors. And uh, image policy webhook, this goes back into that sort of software supply chain, scanning your, your Docker containers, great thing to have. Um, this enforces that your containers have at least gone through a security scan with something like Claire to say, okay, I'm not running, you know, an old version of Ubuntu Precise and it's got all these outdated uh, software packages that are coming along with it. Uh, so a pod security policy. Within your pod definition, you can define uh, what's called a security context. So as Etienne was mentioning, like Docker had this really, really great default seccomp profile 
Um, and it's on by default, you have to disable it if you don't want it for whatever reason. Um, but in Kubernetes, that's, it's, not, it's no longer there. So even though you're running your Docker containers inside uh, Kubernetes, you have to set that as a security context within your container to say, no, actually I do want that seccom profile back. Um, so th that's one of the things you can enable. You can drop the capabilities and, and do all those things that we had recommended. Um, this is where you would define that in your pod security policy for your cluster. Tim Alclair has a great example. It goes through all the different things you can do to lock down a, a pod and set up a pod security policy. Um, and, and these are probably, you know, they may be too restrictive for some of your workloads, especially if you're in a, a platform as a service or something like that where you don't necessarily know what your workloads are going to be running. You need to allow customers to run various things. And, you, you know, a CI, you don't know what people are going to be building. Um, but it's a place to start. At, you know, take things away as you need or add things back in uh, as needed, but start with the most restrictive thing possible. Uh, similarly, uh, a network policy. If you have a multi-tenant container environment uh, running on your cluster, those containers probably don't need to talk to each other. Uh, at least internally in the cluster. And so starting with a very bare bones network policy that says, yeah, you can't talk to each other uh, is a good place to start. Add back in the network communication as needed. You know, if you have a concept of, you know, sh a shared cluster with a single customer, those pods may be able to talk to each other. Um, but in, in by default, they don't need to. Uh, so this is your resource quotas. If you're familiar with Linux C groups, you can define limits on CPU and memory and things like that uh, for your containers. Uh, this lets you say, you know, if, you, if you're running Bitcoin mining on my cluster, like you need to keep it down. Um, so there's, there's a lot. There's a lot of great documentation on Kubernetes. Um, there's all kinds of switches and, and things you can flip and turn on, um, but there's not always a lot of great ways to say, well, why do I need this to use this feature or that feature? Um, it's all very documented, but not like the combination of, of what you should do to have a secure cluster or secure container environment. Um, there's a CIS uh, Kubernetes benchmark, uh, you know, nice thick document that you can read through, uh, but as a, an assessor in a very highly agile development environment, people are deploying clusters and, and doing this. You don't have time to like go through an Excel spreadsheet and, and do a checklist. Things are always changing. Um, there are tools that are out there that you can automate checking against this benchmark. Uh, two of them are KubeBench, Kube Auto Analyzer. You can point it at a cluster, make sure it meets the benchmark or your whitelisted definition of what the benchmark is for your organization, uh, automate that and, and continuously test your clusters to make sure they're meeting the latest benchmarks. Uh, similarly, if you have pod uh, definitions and things like that and you're writing YAML, I'm sorry, um, but kubesec.io has a great API that does static analysis of YAML. So it can see like, oh, you have privileged in this container definition, like that's not great. So um, it'll call that out add that to your uh, version control system, add that to your CI, uh, and then have things fail. Have things fail before they go out, um, and they can be automated with this. You don't have to worry about uh, finding a security assessor to constantly check things and have security be a roadblock uh, for testing the security uh, of your cluster as it evolves. And then the, the companion tool to that is Kube Hunter. It looks at the same things, but then also lets you exploit it, which is uh, a whole lot of fun. Um, so you can, you know, the, the, the thing that I found in security, uh, as I'm sure many of you also find, is understanding how you're supposed to secure things uh, can help you understand how to look for vulnerabilities to break things. Uh, and so using those same benchmarks, the CIS benchmarks for like, you should enable this for your Kubernetes cluster, and then when you find it's not, that's your entry point for exploiting the cluster and helping the security, you know, helping the engineering team, the operations team running it, uh, lock it down some more. Um, so just some, some credit and, and thank you. Um, you know, these are some of the folks whose uh, prior research and, and tools and things have inspired and influenced us in our research and in our um, own education in, in locking down security, in you know, locking down the security of our, our clusters and in researching other people's clusters and deployments. Um, so, you know, we really owe, owe it, a, a debt to, the, to their work that came before us. And that's it. Our slides will be up there and, and I'm sure spread around as well. So thank you very much.